please give a warm Georgia Tech welcome to Katherine Finney. Thank you. Thank you. It is so great to be with you this afternoon slash evening. Uh, my name is Katherine Finney and I'm the founder and managing director of Digital Undivided. And so today I'm going to talk but hopefully we'll have a little fun too. So um, I expect some interaction. Uh, definitely write down some questions and hopefully we'll have a really robust discussion and, and some fun today. So I'm going to start off uh, by telling a little story. I love stories. How many people here remember the 1990s? Okay, good. Thank you. I don't feel like completely out of the place. So in the 1990s, uh, there was a rapper of middling talent who found himself in the most cliche of situations. He owed the IRS money. Lots and lots of money. Over $3 million to be exact. Now this was the 1990s. This was before rap became the global phenom that it is now. So at this time, you know, Jay-Z was a part-time rapper, full-time drug dealer. <laughs> Puffy hadn't gotten to the Puff Daddy stage yet. He was still an intern at Uptown Magazine. And 50 cents didn't even have 10 cents. <laughs> so there was really no way to make the kind of money that this rapper needed to make in order to pay the IRS unless she went into acting. Acting was the way in which you kind of got money. Now, even at this time, it was still a little bit early in the acting game. Most of the people who were in acting, particularly the rappers, were doing dramas. Uh, and at that time, this is the mid-1990s, the most famous rapper who was doing acting was Tupac Shakur. And Tupac had been in several movies that had been sort of somewhat successful. So the path was being created. This rapper was offered a TV show based upon his life. I um, mean, it was a great deal. It was going to get him money. It was going to help him get to the next step. It was going to give him a lot more money than he was making from his rap albums. So he did the show. And the show became this great big success. But TV acting at that time did not give the money that he needed to pay the IRS. And this was BK before Kardashian. So, <laughs> No one was really making tons of money from TV, and the only Kardashian at that time was helping get his bestie off from a murder rap. So the actor, the rapper turned actor, said, OK, how do I make money? He was really strategic with it. How do I make money in acting? And so what he did was he took a list of all the top grossing films of the time period looked at the 1980s and the early part of the 1990s. And so he looked at this list and he said, what are the commonalities in this list? And what he noticed was all the top grossing movies were either action movies or sci-fi. And the ones that did really well were kind of both. And they also had a little sprinkling of, of comedy in there as well. So he said, OK. His first movie, of course, did not follow that. He wanted to get his foot in the door. It was a drama. It was critically acclaimed, but that doesn't pay the bills. Uh, so his next movie after that was this action buddy comedy. And that actually did really well. It did 10 times the gross of the first movie, which was this drama. And he said, oh, OK, I'm onto something. So he started to dig deeper. And he started to look and see what the stars of these movies, these top 10 grossing movies, made. And he saw that they were making real bank. This is the Arnold Schwarzeneggers, the Bruce Willis's, the Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford is like, for 20 years, Harrison Ford was just cashing checks <laughs> in the 1980s and 1990s. I mean, his bank has bank. <laughs> and so this rapper turned actor now budding movie star said, OK, I got it. So for his next, next movie, he did an action film that was sci-fi, that had a sprinkling of comedy in it, and then that became a huge hit. It became such a big hit, and at the time, that was the second highest grossing film of all time. And this rapper turned actor, turned movie star, now movie mogul, went on to be one of the top-selling, uh, top-grossing movie stars of all time. 
And he was able to drop his rap moniker and go by his real name, which is Will Smith. And so I use the Will Smith story, which I absolutely love, because he was so strategic about reaching his goals uh, to really illustrate the importance of vision. And when you're looking at going big, and many of you have dreams, you have ideas that you want to see executed, you have things that you want to impact, the first thing that you need to do is have a vision. And sometimes that vision may be something that is not actually in reality yet. So when Will Smith became an action star in the 1990s, there were no black action stars. There was no example. In fact, the biggest black movie stars at that time were comedians. They were Eddie Murphy, um, Richard Pryor, the decade prior. So the role models he had were all comedians. They weren't action stars. That didn't exist. But he could see it, and he could visualize it. And as a result, he turned it into reality. And that idea of being able to visualize something that you can't see has been something that's been really helpful to me in my career and in my path and the work that, that I do. Um, I often feel like I always choose, and this is what my husband said, I always choose like the hardest road. Um, but it's often those roads that lead to the big aha, the big impact. Um, and while I'm on that road, I often think of a quote that I absolutely love by the spiritualist Marianne Williamson. And I'm going to paraphrase it, and you can read it. It's up on the screen. But it's basically by you having this vision, by you shining, by you being yourself, by stepping fully into who you are, you give other people the permission to do the same as well. And that's something I've lived my life by. So I grew up on the mean streets of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Very tough Minneapolis streets. Um, I went to Rutgers for undergrad, went to Yale for graduate school, uh, became an epidemiologist. I didn't get to wear cool things like that. I was more in the lab. Um, and had this um, great career. I was going to save the world. I was so excited until I had a sick parent. And if you've ever had a sick family member before and have been far away from that family member, you know how hard it is to continue your life as normal, to go with your daily sort of schedule as usual while you're still thinking about that family member. And I happened to be 8,000 miles away from home. And that wasn't going to work for me. So I came back to Minneapolis, um, spent time with my father. My father passed away, and my family which is you know, very entrepreneurial, very uh, outgoing. Instead of doing what normal families would do, which is you know, take some time out to mourn, we started a business. And we started a dry cleaning business in Minneapolis. We owned eight dry cleaners uh, throughout the city at our height. And things were amazing until they weren't. And I learned a lot. I was in my early 20s. I had just graduated from Yale. And I learned a lot about not only just business, but business with people you love, particularly business with family. And so one of the things that I learned was whatever role you have in your family, that is the role people will try to put you in in your business. So if you're the little sister in your family and you start a family business, you'll have that little, little sister role in that business. And that's regardless of where you went to school, how much experience you have, and that's because that's what your family knows you as. That's the role you play in your family. And it was really difficult uh, for my family to make the switch from that. Um, my mother was the CEO. She's my mom. In the family, she was the CEO. Um, she didn't want to take direction from her daughter. Uh, and as a mother, I can kind of understand it now. I didn't understand it then, but now I definitely understand it. And so. I wanted to not only just love my family, but like my family, and I wanted them to still like me. So I left. I left the business. And the business ended horribly, and I learned a lot from that failure. And that's another important point as you go on your career path or your entrepreneurial path, is you're going to fail. You are. That's almost 100% certainty. Now, the degrees in which you fail may, may fluctuate. You may fail a little bit. You may fail spectacularly big. But you will fail, and that's OK. Actually, that's great to fail. Um, and the reason why it's great is that it's from that that you actually learn. And I learned a lot. 
not only about working with family, but I also learned what I wanted to do. I learned how to structure a business. I learned about things like cap tables. I learned about how to work with consultants. That was a really big thing. If you want to ask me questions about that, please do. Um, I learned a lot of great things. And so I went back to Philly after the, the company failed and started a blog. Now, this was 2002. And 2002 blogs weren't really a thing. No one really knew what they were. It was usually folks in tech who were writing it. It was people who were sort of documenting their processes of creation. It was a very sort of um, hidden thing from the mass market, right, the general public. So I started this blog, and I started about shopping. And it was because I was spending too much money. And my husband was like, hey, we are trying to start a family. He's newly married. It's like, sister, you're spending too much money. Maybe you might want to like, write about it instead of actually spending it. And I said, oh, cool. Like, I'll write about going to Nordstrom's Rack. And so I started the blog, and it was the perfect time. This was right before the 2004 election. And what happened in the 2004 election was this phenomenon called swift boating. It was a whole big swift boating episode with one of the presidential candidates, John Kerry. And John Kerry had a group of uh, men that he was in the army with in Vietnam War who came out via some blogs and said some things about his record of service. That sparked a whole bunch of interest in blogs. And I happened to be right in the right place at the right time for when people were starting to look for blogs. I also did another thing, and, and I didn't put this up as a slide because I think my husband would kill me, but it's also, you know, make sure that you marry or partner with someone useful. <laughs> and I know that sounds funny, but it's true. And what I mean by useful is not necessarily that they're rich or um, anything like that, but that they can help support your dreams as well as you help support their dreams. I happened to marry someone who had a skill set. I married a software engineer. And when I wanted to do a blog, I had an in-house development team uh, of one who could actually develop my blog for me. And that saved me enormous amounts of time. It saved me enormous amounts of money. And anytime anything broke, I had someone right there who could fix it and had no choice but to fix it. Um, and so it started off really small and it was really exciting. Uh, and it was about three years in that I got a book deal. And so I wrote this book and it was great and it was Random House. And then I started to do a lot of television. And that was really, really fun. Um, it was really interesting, like hanging with Al Roker and stuff. We can have a whole conversation about that. But it was in the middle of this that I started to get emails from a lot of women-led startups. Startups like LearnVest, Guild Group, Rent the Runway, who were just starting off and who said, hey, can you write about us? I was like, sure, that's amazing. I love what you're doing. But I also had an idea that maybe I could do it too. I had this platform. I had experience in business before. My company, my blog turned into a media company, was making lots of money. You know, I'm going to do this. So I entered into one of the early incubator programs in New York City. And it was one of the first times that I felt um, that people had no expectations of me. And my idea was a birch box for black women. I was super excited. I was like, I know this market. I, have, uh, I know the market. I know how to get the products. Um, I know that black women purchase 40% of all hair care products in the United States, so we, we got this. And when I presented to the incubator program, I was met with a level of hostility that I frankly had never experienced in my life. Now, I grew up in Minneapolis. I was used to being the only black person in the room. That was not a problem. What I wasn't used to was people thinking that I was less than because of my skin color and because of my gender. In fact, when I got up to pitch, super excited, uh, got up to pitch my idea, one of the founders in the program stood up and said, I don't think you can relate to other black women. He said this in a group of 50 mostly male, mostly white VCs. 
And so, of course, me being me, I said, oh, do tell. I mean, maybe he grew up in Harlem. Maybe he's from Southwest Atlanta. I don't know. Maybe he knows something. And he said, I don't think you can relate because you have an accountant. As if black women can't have accountants. And I didn't know how to respond to that. The amount of mental gymnastics I had to do in that five second time period to come up with a response. I was sitting from in front of a room that was about this full, maybe a little bit fuller. How do you respond to that? What do you do? He wasn't asking me about my business. He wasn't asking me about my business model. Wasn't asking me how I'm going to scale. He wasn't asking me what the return was going to be, what's my customer acquisition cost, none of the business things. He was questioning my identity. And more importantly, he was questioning my right to even be in the room talking about starting a business. And that really stuck with me. I later sold my company, and I went to go work for another woman-led organization called BlogHer. Uh, Blogger then sold to another woman organization that then also sold. So I was a part of a number of exits. And while I was at BlogHer, I started to think, why aren't there more women who look like me in this space? Why aren't we creating startups? What's happening? Why are we not allowed the pathway into this? And so one of the things that I learned from that experience was the importance of trusting yourself. Uh, when I left the incubator, I should have trusted myself and my ID 